Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you, everyone. I, I was so excited to come here. I've been doing my homework, and you, this is a, a remarkable company, um, which are gonna, you're going to do remarkable things, especially based uh, after, to, after my talk. Um, <laughs> I did want to talk to you about purpose. I, I, uh, I, I'm a big believer in storytelling, and once you have your purpose and a company has their purpose, you start to tell stories about your company, and you start to tell stories about yourself. And I want to start with, with a story that I, I really love that will give you a, a really clear idea, not about Ashley or, or Broad River, but about yourselves. I like starting with people, not companies. So this is for you. It's for you to think about your own distinctive gift. And something to think about later on tonight, after I tell you this story, I'm sure you'll remember her. Her was a young woman. She was 19 years old, African American. All her life, her parents recognized that she was the most remarkable dancer and that if they gave her the right tutelage, if they sent her to the right schools, if they got two extra jobs to send her to those schools, she could be one of the greatest dancers that ever lived. And they did. They actually, they had four jobs. Uh, they put her through the best schools. And at the age of 19 years old, the Apollo Theater in Harlem sent a invitation to this woman to dance. It was supposed to be the greatest moment in dance history at the Apollo. The place, 3,700 seats were packed. The press was there, her mother was there, oh, ne nephews, nieces, parents, everybody was there. And she was standing behind the curtain when there Charlie got up and said, I am going to present to you the most remarkable dancer. The early reviews are stunning and what you're going to do is you're going to witness history in the most profound sense. And he introduces this woman and she walks onto the stage and taps the microphone and says, Mommy, I, I can't dance. And the place is just like this, except with 3,700 people, but it was so quiet. And her mother started to tear up, and her father, and the press, they didn't know what to do. The MC didn't know what to do. And she looked out to her mom, and she said, I'm not, I can't dance, but I, I do want to sing. And Ella Fitzgerald <laughs> belted out a song that changed music history, and for that matter, the world. Now, why this story? Because like so many of us who've been taught by our parents, our peers, and our professors to do something that's right for you, that is a perilous path. They thought it was right for her, and she was a great dancer, a tremendous talent. But her purpose, her why, was to sing, not to dance. She might have been a great dancer, but she loved singing. And this is the key about human purpose. What do I love? What am I good at? And how will it help the world? And the first two questions are the hard ones. What do I love and what am I good at? Because what happens is because of our parents, professors, and, and peers, the three Ps that pee all over us, we, we <laughs> tend to gravitate towards what we're good at and what we've been trained to do versus what we love to do. And the chasm between love and talent is enormous. You close that chasm and you end up in Ella Fitzgerald, loving what you do and doing it really well and making people smile. That's personal purpose. And it's, it's, when, when you find it, when you find what you love and you get good at it, you are totally blessed. Now, 
This is not a new idea purpose. I get a lot of credit for it because I brought it into the business arena. Aristotle in 4 BC had his own curriculum. It was a five-year curriculum, sort of like going to college. The first three years, you would find out what your distinctive gift was. This, for three years, you read, the, you read and you talked and you had dialogue and you'd find out what is your distinctive gift, what is my great talent. And the last two years was how will you use that talent to change the world. On one side of the circle was your distinctive gift. There was another circle and it said the needs of the world. And where those two circles intersected, he called it vocare. That's Latin for calling. Not a job, not a career, a calling. He felt that people who had jobs, they, that they, they had, they were, their work was too small for their spirit. But when they found their calling, there was nothing they couldn't do. There was no way they couldn't persevere. And this was a tremendous, really incredible revolution of the heart, not the mind. You thought you were going to see Aristotle for your mind, but he taught that the path to purpose is a path from the mind to the heart. And that is purpose. So 25 years ago, I had a ridiculous idea to take that learning and say, I, I wonder if companies could do this. I wonder if companies could have a purpose. Not just a mission, not just a vision, but a purpose, a why. And if they had that why, would they demonstrate the same characteristics as the great leaders, great revolutionaries, great missionaries throughout history who had a purpose and because they had a purpose and it's dangerous to have a purpose I must tell you because when you get one you can't go back. You, the purpose whispers to you in the middle of the night and if you don't listen to it it starts to shout. And that's when we have anxiety, which leads to depression. You know, I was in class this morning, and I said, it was the first class of the semester, and I said, you know, I was talking about, about the, the brain. In fact, you're going to have to be my clicker. Let's go to, I was talking about the brain, yeah. Okay. So this is our brain, and this part of it, the, oh, that's fabulous. Thank you. This, okay, I'll try. I'm Jewish, so I can't do technology. Okay. okay. So uh, this part of the this part of the brain is called the prefrontal cortex. And the prefrontal cortex is the reason we have purpose. So when we're born, the brain has been formed, but this part of the brain is not exactly, it's the last place to be formed. And it's, it's, the, it's sort of the radar that looks for meaning. It's always asking questions and searching for meaning. And, and, and by the way, why not? Human beings since the beginning of time, our time, we have been meaning-seeking creatures. We can live 40 days without food, we can live four days without water, but the brain, the prefrontal cortex, if it shuts down for more than 20 seconds, you die. And when I mean die, there's nothing there. You just, it is, it's, there, there's a blankness, and it never shuts off, which is why when I ask my students, how many of you had anxiety last night and stayed up all night, because it's the first day of class, all the hands went up, because when that prefrontal cortex is out of control, you start like all like well, you've been all been there. Your your brain starts overdrive. You can't sleep. Though you think the worst things, you twist things, you magnify them, you minimize them, you make stuff up. But when the prefrontal cortex is in cool mode, and you are looking for your purpose, and you're looking for a story, and you you're at a movie, and you feel like you're part of it. That prefrontal cortex is the happiest cortex, it, part of the brain, because you are now becoming part of a bigger story. And when you become part of a bigger story, the brain secretes uh, dopamine. And it's a great word, dopamine, because it's the real dope. I mean, it's, it's you, like dopamine, you're exhilarated. And you're exhilarated because you feel like you're part of something bigger. Now, when the brain shuts down, it produces the other drug called cortisol which my father, uh, it, it, he died of uh, adrenal cancer. And that was an over-secretion of cortisol created by stress, which we all have. And the key thing is to pick the right drug, which is dopamine. Um, and, if, and that drug, of course, is secreted when we feel like we're on, a, on some greater purpose, when we are doing something beyond ourselves, not just for ourselves, but beyond ourselves. So. So 
Now we go to the companies 25 years ago, and we start creating methodology that looks at organizations and looks at their ethos, their beginnings, and looks at their culture, and looks at their values, and looks at their purpose. And what do we find? We find that companies with purpose are happier companies. We find that they're intellectually more prowess. We find that they're emotionally engaged, that people actually love coming to work. And we find out, and this would made a lot of people very, very happy, we find out that if you took a 10-year swath, a 10-year period, of S&P 500 companies and you looked at their return on investment, it would come out to 133% when this study was done. And for those of you who like Jim Collins and Good to Great and Built to Last, those companies, 333. But the companies over a 10-year period that had purpose, that articulated an authentic purpose and then activated that purpose, 13, over 1,300% return on investment. That is remarkable. And that is, that kept me in business for a little while because people want to hear metrics. They want to know the data. Until then, I remember I, w I went to Bob Nardelli at Home Depot uh, back in 1994. I was talking to him about purpose. Uh, this is the CEO of Mar uh, Home Depot. And he says, wait a second, are you selling me multi-purpose cleaner? Like, that's how <laughs> nobody knew what purpose. Now, now, I went into a grocery store last week and I went to the uh, vegetable section and it said peas with purpose. And I thought, okay, I'm done. <laughs> so let's see. Okay, so this you're somewhat familiar with because I see it in your literature. I see it on the walls. I've talked to Charlie about it. These three areas people get mixed up with. Oddly enough, of, of hundreds upon hundreds of companies I've spoken to, you're, I think, one of three or four companies that didn't get it mixed up. You got, I mean, you actually know the difference between a mission and a vision. But just to, just, to, <clears throat> just to go over the nomenclature, a mission is what we do every day uh, to, be the, you know, to be the best home furnishing retailer. It's, it's what we do. It's, it's easy to state. Actually, the word mission is from, it's a, it's a, a word from the military. Back when the military was created and they had missions, every mission was only 72 hours at the most. Because you had something to do, the mission was Tuesday, we had a mission, we had to accomplish it by Friday, there were no five-year mission strap plans that, that we've made up in business. It was really, what do I do every single day? A vision is where the company is going, the aspiration of a company. And aspirations are great. I mean, they're fabulous. However, if you just aspire, you will end up, well, I hate to say this, but companies that only aspire, expire, because it's a lot of energy and a lot of stress to just have this vision out there and having to take this hill or expand geographically or expand financially. Visions are usually geographic or financial. However, if you have a purpose, so mission is a what, vision is a where, and purpose is a why. If you have that why, according to Frederick Nietzsche, who said it best, he said, if you have a why, you can deal with any what, who, where, and when. And then Clinton would say later on during his administration that if you have a why, you can buffer any adversity and you can bolster every celebration. So we have an interesting situation here with the purpose. A purpose is actually, when you talk about amplifying and igniting, it's an amplifier to what mission is and a vision is and actually can ignite an entire company. Missions and visions are hard to be the ignition point, but a purpose is the ignition point and is the amplification point. Let's see. So again, Aristotle. Who we are, who Broad River is, and what is the need of the world. And then in the middle, after we understand who Broad River is, and then we understand the needs in the world, or a need in the world. I mean, you don't have to go and visit with, you know, the North Korea, Jun Kong, you don't, you, need, you don't need to go there. Uh, <laughs> it can be something very, very simple. It could be making people just feel alive and have the rapture or the security of life. And there lies our purpose. Purpose, the two characteristics of purpose from day one, and this is a controversial 
it's probably why Fast Company likes me, but I, I think that, and I'm writing a new book on the fact that that purpose started with the Big Bang. And I, I must tell you, this is, I have five astrophysicists who think it's brilliant, and then I have another six who think I'm having a drug flashback from college. Um, so, but, but I really believe that the Big Bang, the two characteristics of purpose as I've seen in the last quarter century are intention, so you have to have great intention, like I really want to do something good, and you have to make a contribution. And the Big Bang, the way I see it, as a neophyte in astrophysics, is a, a time not of explosion, but of expansion. There was this big expansion, and by the way, Stephen Hawking has proved that the expansion keeps going. So it has great intention, and the contributions are the universe, the galaxies, the stars, the planets, and all of us here. And I, and I think that there is a anthropological, there's really a, a great metaphor there. Uh, and if we understood that and understood the power of the universe, we could really understand what I believe is a much greater force than gravity, which actually pulls things down, but purpose, which pushes things forward. And I'd much rather be pushed forward than pulled down. Um, so let me tell you, uh, you know, I love telling stories. And you're going to love this story. <laughs> uh, let me tell you about how purpose came about. At, and during that story, I think I'll illustrate all the character, other characteristics of purpose that you could take home with you and use for yourself or that we could use at, uh, at Broad River Retail. Um, this is an absolute true story. I've known for some hyperbole, but I've got to tell you, if you read my book, I hope you read the book. This, this, well, I'm going to give you more than th that's in the book, but there's, it's a, it's, I just love it. Okay, so um, 15 years ago, I, I was like, getting to be known for purpose. Some companies were inviting me in and were doing purpose. And I get a call from the CEO, actually not the CEO, the CEO's EA or chief of staff at Procter & Gamble, a guy named Bob McDonald. And uh, he says, you know, I've heard, I heard you speak in Rome and in Italy and it was very fascinating. I'd like you to come and talk to all our brand managers at Procter & Gamble and, and just share with them your idea about purpose because we don't, we don't have purpose here. We have an equity pyramid. We have missions, we have brand equity, we have blah, 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 all this stuff, nomenclature. And uh, if you could come for an hour, that would be amazing. And we'll have the 311 brand, head of brands, of all the brands at Procter & Gamble. And you know that we're the smartest people in the world, so this is a good audience for you. So yeah, thanks, okay. So um, I fly up there, and I've got my deck, and remember, Purpose is pretty new now. I mean, this is the first time P&G has seen anything about Purpose. So. I'm at the back, I'm over here. Well, I, let, me, let me replay this so I can get into it. I'm back over here, and there's a stage manager over here who's just mic'd me up. And the, out there's 311 of the smartest people in the world. And the stage manager actually says to me, Mr. Ryman, oh, Professor, I'm sorry. Uh, I looked at your deck, I don't understand it, and I should tell you that these people out there are really a very hard audience. They'll be on their Blackberries. iPhones weren't out yet. It was just Blackberries. They'll be on their Blackberries. They have walked out on other speakers. And based on your presentation, I think this might be the worst speech you'll ever give. OK. <laughs> You're on. <laughs> and I walk out into this, what looks to me like a coliseum with gladiators and <laughs> lions and tigers. I mean, these people were really had no time. They were on their Blackberries. Their eyeballs were like rolling perpetually. Um, and people, as I was walking this way, there were people actually walking out the door. And um, so I, I thought, OK, maybe they're going to the restroom or something. Uh, so I said, look, um, I'm not going to take too much of your time. I just have a few questions for you. Uh, and it was like, oh, you know, you could hear the <laughs> that, that. Um, And I, I said, uh, I, I, I just so my first question, um, uh, sir, please don't leave yet. And you know, it's like I, I was doing this all the time. Pl please don't. My first question is, what were the two products your founders, Procter and Gamble, made? And you hear, oh God, this guy's an idiot. Candles and soap. Hey, candles and soap. So the entire place is going candles and soap, and like laughing. And who's this guy? And I feel sorry for him. And it was not. It was not pretty. And people started to leave. And I actually said, please don't leave until I ask you the second question. And they were like, Pfft. so I said, why? 
another Ella Fitzgerald moment. It was like nobody, including the CEO, could say anything. It was complete silence. The doors closed. The people sat down. And I said, really? Because I was angry. <laughs> uh, and uh, then I lightened up a bit. And I said, hmm, uh, President McDonald, do you, you know, no? Why don't you tell us? Like he was trying to get out of this. So I said, okay, I'm going to tell you a story on why. Let me go back to the 17th, 18th century. Let's go back to Jimmy and Billy, Procter and Gamble, James and William. James and William were two guys, very entrepreneurial guys. One was from Scotland. The other was from Ireland. They were friends. And they said, you know what? We're going to make it big in the United States. Let's go to the United States and we're going to, let's start a big company. Oh, yeah, let's do that. So they didn't have very much money. These are immigrants, the original immigrants. They get a passage, just like Titanic, um, uh, on, a, on a boat, you know, with the card playing and everything. And they're on the boat, and they're having a great time, and they're talking about how great it's going to be in the United States. Um, and Billy, w William, is at dinner, and because James wanted to take a nap, and he meets Olivia. Olivia. She's 21. She's gorgeous. She's, un I mean, he just falls, he's smitten. He falls madly in love. With like they're dancing. It's like love boat. Uh, it's crazy. Uh, and he gets back and James says, where the, where the hell, what, what, where were you? He says, I met the most amazing woman. Well, now no one's going to the bathroom at Procter & Gamble. Like there, it's like the original soap opera. And this is, a, so uh, he says, really, that's amazing. I'm really happy for you. He says, I've got amazing news for you. I have the best news for you, James. She has a twin sister, Rose. <laughs> he goes, all right. So they go up, Billy, Rose, Olivia, and Jimmy. It is Titanic without going down. It is just <laughs> unbelievable. And they, they really are, they fall in love and they dance. And it, it's just amazing. They should make a movie out of this. And one day they will probably. And, um, they get to the United States and <clears throat> they keep, they don't want to get off the boat. And there's another passage up the Cincinnati River. And they take this passage to up the Cincinnati River. These people are in love. I don't, I don't know what they were doing. I was 19th century, but they were in love. I mean, it was a, like going crazy. And uh, Rose gets a stomach ache. Not like, I mean, that was too soon. I mean, I, it was like a five, <laughs> seven day trip. But she gets a stomach ache. <clears throat> That's a, it's a 14 day voyage, so we're, who knows? I don't, nobody knows this. And she, uh, they, they get off the boat. First of all, Rose, Olivia says, I gotta get off the boat with Rose. I can't leave my sister. The two guys go, we're coming with you. We, we're gonna come with you. So they come with, two weeks later, both are engaged. And the father, who actually lives in Cincinnati, because that was why they took the trip, invites them over, the, 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 the soon-to-be son-in-laws, to his house. And they have this magnificent dinner in Cincinnati. And the father says, uh, so what are you guys going to do now that my uh, daughters are about to go off my payroll on to yours? And he, he, they said, Dad, I think it was James, he said, we're going to build the most amazing company. Really? What, really? What's it called? It's going to be called Procter and Gamble. <laughs> he goes, great. OK, so what are you guys going to do? Dad, it's going to be called Procter <laughs> and gamble. And he says, I know, but what are you guys going to do? I, we don't know, but it's going to be called Procter and Gamble. And uh, apparently the story goes that these guys went away. Uh, they were invited back three weeks later for brunch. And they looked at the, uh, at hey, back to Aristotle. They looked, I mean, they didn't know about Aristotle. They didn't read my book or anything, but they were, they, were, they were trying to figure out how can we help the world. It was like a, a, a benevolent, like a good thing. Like, what, what does the world need? You know? And they came up with an amazing idea. They go back. The father says, so, Procter and Gamble, what are you guys going to do? Dad, we have a great idea. We're going to make candles. And then James says, and soap. <laughs> and the father and the mother start to cry. <laughs> Last question, why? Well, now, the P&G people are so rivet. It's like they went from this to this. And I just stood there because I was angry. <laughs>
And I thought, this is too good. I'm just going to, I'm going to marinate in this moment. <laughs> and I said to them, I said, here's the deal, guys. Two things were going on in the United States when these two young gentlemen decided to make candles and soap. One was called the Civil War. And what happened during the Civil War is that both sides tried to blow the electricity out on the other side. So then they could actually just annihilate them with guns. So we had two things going on. We had darkness we had, and gunshots, which led to dysentery. So really the issue were not the guns. It was the dysentery, the dysentery, and the darkness. And these two guys, smart people, came up with the idea of candles to, to blind the darkness, to light, relit, to light things up, and the soap to take the dysentery or mitigate as much of the dysentery as possible. Well, when this came out, it was like, it was Jonestown without Kool-Aid. I mean, this, the <laughs> whole place went, it was like, what, what, oh my God, you know? And all, everybody started talking about, well, what do we do? What, what a secret, what, what about Charmin? What, what a, you know, what, what about Bounty and Don? What about all these, th I mean, it was incredible. Che uh, nice and easy, people, uh, what, what, what does that mean? So everybody realized that if they were to go back to their ethos, their beginnings, that they might be able to pull out a breadcrumb or a treasure that would lead them to Mecca, that would lead them to, to uh, something much greater than just selling stuff. I mean, selling stuff, really? I mean, you can't get enough of what you don't need. So this is a perpetual problem. Um, so, so let me tell you uh, uh, what happened. Uh, just a couple cases here. Um, okay, this, this might be my second favorite one, which is why I put it first, so that you'll be very excited about the next one. Um, so I started thinking to myself, wait, I think I got something here. Procter & Gamble loves this. I got a lot of business. I'm doing this over here. I'm doing this over here. Um, and I go to a board meeting with this woman. I'm on the board of something called World Team Sports. That's Diana Nyad. And Diana says to me, you know, Joey, I'm going to be 60 years old, and I really, I really want to, um, I, I want to do something that helps women really become more fearless. And uh, I said, oh, that's great, Diana. You know, she says, do you know any, like, like you, you know everybody. Like, can someone give me $35,000, and I can, I can leave. I'll jump in the water from Cuba, and I'll swim to Florida. I said, look, I don't know. You know, I, I was like, I'll try. I'll think about it. But I went home, and I went to myself, oh, my God, wait a second. Hold everything. Wait a you know, um, some, there must be a product at Procter & Gamble. A week later, I get a call from Secret. And Secret says, we want you to see our purpose. Secret deodorant. You know, Secret deodorant. So I go up to, the, I said, so what's your purpose, Secret? The brand manager says, to be rockalicious. I, I said, what? <laughs> what? No, you don't understand. I said, no, I don't understand. He said, let me explain it to you. We're going to put a, uh, we're going to put a gem, a precious gem, in the deodorant. So when she is rubbing herself on, on her arm, the, she'll feel this gem. And I went, are you guys, this, you, this is a joke, right? I mean, I, so, I, so it was, I just was mortified. I, 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 I couldn't believe, I mean, who comes up with something like that? So, so I said, look, let me, I, I have a, I, I, why don't we do some ethotic work? I mean, ethotic word meaning, let's go back to the beginning of Secret and find out, just like Parker Gale, like, what was Secret? What, what is Secret? So we find the, the founders. They're still alive. Two women who in 1953 saw women going into the workplace and said, you know what? If women are working going to the workplace, they need their own deodorant. But they're going to sweat too. But we don't care, really care about the deodorant. It should be strong, but it should be a symbol, a symbol for women. Really, a symbol from the Greek, by the way, symbolion, I know a little Greek, which means to take heaven and earth, put it together, and throw it out there. And, and after a lot of time and a lot of thought, they came around to this idea. And I said, there's a woman out there named Diana Nyad. You know, here your founders wanted to help women become more fearless. And there's a woman about to jump into the water from Cuba and swim all the way by herself to Florida. Why don't we call her? 
and give her $35,000, you $2.4 billion <laughs> brand. And they said, whoa, we got to run that up the flagpole. I said, there is no flagpole. This is ridiculous. I'm asking you for $35,000 on a $2.4 billion brand. This could be a breakthrough. And I finally convinced them. They gave her $35,000. They changed their purpose to helping women of all ages become more fearless because the founders had found that in the beginning and it had been lost just like great purposes are always lost. We lose them out to sea. We, we throw strategy on it, culture on it. We, we just bury it. We, we, it, we embalm it. it, it dies. But if it's found again, it can be revived. So she fit the bill for female role models. I brought Diana in. She got the $35,000 and you'll read in the book, I don't want to tell you the whole story, but she was pulled out of the water because box jellyfish stung her lips. She almost died. Um, of course, Proctor called me the next day and said, what happened? I said, what do you mean what happened? Like, it's my fault the box jellyfish? Go you know, they said, uh, uh, well, you, to you told us, you told us that she would be swimming. I said, no, I told you she'd be a symbol. Why don't we put up a website for another $35,000 and have people uh, follow her? So they put this website up. Um, and uh, she tries again and fails. And again, a hurricane almost takes her out. And again. And now it's up to uh, $215,000. And PNG saying, are you sure? You know, we're spending a lot of money. And I said, just stick with her. In the meantime, the website, all these women were sending Diane and I had like suntan lotion and shark repellent. It was just you push a button. It wasn't the real stuff. But they were engaged. That Facebook page became the second fastest <coughs> growing Facebook page on the planet. Double digit. They, the ROI award for all the brands, they won three years in a row. And it was all because they decided not to do ads, but to take actions that were more purposeful, that had a why in it, and that could perhaps change someone's life. Not because of what they put under their arm, but because of what they put inside their heart via Diane and I had. Well, this was the talk of the town. I had religious status, a good hall pass for good two years. Um, and, and, all, and out comes uh, this, this brand. And I know you've seen Like a Girl. Um, uh, Bright House, my consultancy, uh, we did a lot of research into the ethos, again, and of, of, all, of always, and found that, uh, brought in a lot of luminaries and found that this notion of helping women helping women with what they need, that beneath it, there was something much greater, which is helping young girls with what they need most of all, which was confidence. And we found out uh, through science and through the founders, um, and we had a tremendous uh, a group of people come together. It was just remarkable that girls at puberty, between the ages of 9 and, and 13, there's a window there that if they're not instilled with purpose, they will never ever reach their full potential. And now the studies, this is now years old, the studies are out, there are books on confidence. And of course, Proctor grabbed onto this idea um, that, that girls lose their confidence during puberty. The Like a Girl campaign was created by their ad agency with our strategy and our purpose. And you can see these numbers here. Two and a half billion brand and impressions rated number one Super Bowl spot. Now. <laughs> I remember one of the brand people said, but wait a second, Super Bowl is about football. I said, hey guys, football players have daughters, okay? They do. It's not just sons. You don't get a football player and you only have sons. There's a lot of daughters out there. And of course, this made history and, and today it is still impacting the world in a very compelling and provocative way. Um, let's see. This is Kroger. You have Kroger here, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah sort of, sort of. Yeah. So, but Kroger's an enormous company. And um, their, 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 their story is amazing. They actually started, it was sort of like a, another love fest between this guy and his, his wife. And they only made two things, bread and fl flowers. Because they thought they would need the bread to eat and the flowers to love. It was a very sort of peace and love story. And of course, the story had been completely forgotten. And we went back to the beginnings and found that the people who started Kroger actually, um, the people who bought from Kroger went to Kroger not for the food, but because they felt great when they left. Now, this sounds so simple, but it's so simple. And I won't give you all of the data and the 200-page deck and the 14 months of work, but I will show you the film. Um, and these are, these are 
Bright House would always make these films uh, to show the company. Uh, it was only for all these films, I've made over 200 of them, uh, are only for the company. They're never to go outside, but it's to tell the company, hey, this is who you are. This is your mirror. This is what we found. And then it's shown to all the company, and then the company, of course, recognizes themselves in the, in the film, and they're on fire forever. So let's run this. It's just a three-minute film. Amazing about where they had been and where they could go. In addition, the company gave an increase in their bonus, incentivized them, gave them a, a, a better wage, and actually took the action, demonstrable actions behind the purpose. And guess what? The Krogers that saw this and worked it are the Krogers who are at the very top of all the Krogers. So this is now rolling out nationally, but it's a great testament to the power of purpose. And feeding and, and not just feeding people, but feeding the spirit of people, which is what has been so damaged and so cut down, if not destroyed, in, in the last three, four decades. I have people in the audience always that, I, I bring this slide because I, I just think there are two important data points. Um, Gallup did a poll in the United States that looked at all people working in the United States. And they found out that 71% of the people working today are not feeling great about their week. They just feel like somewhere between malaise and, yeah, it's OK. Yeah, that was good. Yeah, I'm looking forward to the weekend. Nothing really tragic. However, 25% of the 71%, Gallup called cave dwellers. And cave is an acronym for consistently against virtually everything. <laughs> and this is a disturbing data point. Because what it means is that people are desperate for meaning, desperate for meaning. And they mix that desperation up with desperation for money. But if you have meaning, you make money. And, and, and if you have no meaning, all you can do is make money and still feel desperate because they found out that people are uh, at the top, at the 1%, are just as unhappy as the people lower down because they just have lost their meaning. And as I said earlier, that's the, that's the number, 1681. Over a 10-year period, a uh, return on investment on all indices to companies who have an authentic purpose. Not a purpose, I mean, not, not just something made up, but something authentic and deep to, in their core. Um, let's see. Okay. Okay, so every consultant, uh, and I sold my consultancy to the Boston Consulting Group, so I don't do these anymore, but every consultant has a two-by-two, two, and I, I developed this many years ago, and I thought I'd share it with you. It's a lot of fun. Um, okay, so on this... A two by two, we've got this, it's a matrix. And the further you go along this, th th this arrow here, the more performance oriented you are, the more you're focused on profit. Like Six Sigma, I don't know if you're familiar with Six Sigma, Six Sigma but it's over here, okay? Um, now, on this, this vertical axis, the Y axis is purpose. So the higher up you go, the more purpose you are. So the far to the right, the more performance you are. And I developed this uh, to look at companies was just a hypothesis. And I, I, I thought of four different companies. First, a fiefdom or a plantation. This is, this is a company that's really like slave. I mean, this is like slave labor. The, no, th this is run by a boss and like double SOB backwards boss. This is, okay, you don't want to work at this place. This is, this is minimum wage. This is crap. This is like, I hate my job. Okay, so it's a fiefdom. Up in the castle, uh, because they're, by the way, they're not making money at all. They're incrementalists. They're not making money, and they have no purpose. I mean, they're just like, they just go to work. It's like, like if you saw the time machine with the, the L-Joy, like, like, like just going to work. So uh, Castle in the Sky is a company that has enormous purpose, but they have no idea how to operate their company. And we got a lot of those at Starbucks right now. There are a lot of, lot of Castle in the Skies who are actually working on their, de on their deck right now at, at, at Starbucks. And then we've got the fortress, which when I, when I built this matrix, I would say 95% of the companies in the United States and Europe were fortresses. These are companies that the bottom line is everything. Let's go out there. Let's have some collateral damage. Shut down Dallas. Let's be militaristic. Let's kill these guys. And it's all about the comp, com, being c competitive, which, by the way, from the Latin, the word, I, I said this in class this morning, the word competition is from the Latin competare, which means to thrive together. Okay. So we got that really screwed up. Um, OK, so the fortress. And then Camelot, I based that because I love JFK. And I, you know, Jackie Kennedy called the years, in, the idyllic years in the White House Camelot. And if you looked at the Alan J. Lerner musical, you'd, you'd learn 
that Camelot is not, a, it's like a made up place, but it, and it has to be fueled and nurtured every day and it goes away if you don't take care of it. And I thought, wow, that's a great metaphor, a great symbol for a company that's both purposeful and profitable. So let me give you some poster children. Uh, Fiveton, Department of Motor Vehicles in Georgia. Uh, <laughs> Uh, really, I, I went there. I had a broken foot. I, I, I had broken my foot. I had to get my license. I said, do you have a seat? They go, no, we only have licenses. I mean, I'm like, I, what kind of people are that? Everyone's angry. They're yelling at each other. You know, it's horrible. It's filthy. Okay, so here's, that's a five tone. Now, Castle in the Sky is a little more interesting. I actually met the greatest Castle in the Sky. I, um, I was reading about companies that are doing better than all these other companies. You might guess this company. Um, uh, yeah, I think you've all been there. Uh, so I go up to the company, and I, I say, I need to meet with the CEO. It's Scott Lemongood. Okay, I'll tell you the company. Uh, it's Krispy Kreme. And this company is so purposeful. I walk in there, I swear, the, every ceiling has clouds on it. He's grown a beard. He's got a tattoo with his purpose. Um, every, there's milk in every office. You've got to have four donuts every hour. You, you know, I mean, it's like, it, 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 it was, it's totally religious, over the top, like, an evangelical corporation. I mean, like everybody's the mantras, the cards, and the things on the thing, and the I, hi, and yes, and all that, everything. So I said to, uh, I said to Scott, I, I said, this is amazing. I've never seen anything like this. I'm going to write about you in my book. He goes, oh, please do that. You know, we are on cloud nine here, hence I, Castle and Scott. Because when I got back three months later, this company that was on the cover of Ad Age, Ad Week, Forbes, and Fortune, all within six months as the darling of Main Street and Wall Street, they're shuttering 300 stores. The CFO is going to prison. You know, all these things are happening. I'm going, oh, my God, you can be purposeful and completely screw up the world. And that's really what happened. Um, now, the fortress is in, even more interesting. And, and I, I promised Ted, I think it was Ted, you know, I, I promised I'd tell a Bob Nardelli story. Okay, Bob Nardelli's former CEO, worked with Ted over at uh, Home Depot. I, I didn't mean to disparage you. Uh, okay, okay, so uh, I go to see Bob Nardelli, and he says, respectfully, now this guy is a military officer. He fired, he, before I'd gotten to the meeting, he had fired his entire leadership and, only, and decided he'd only hire JMOs. I never heard that, junior military officers. This is Home Depot, 400,000 people. The, you know, the, this amazing place that Bernie and, and Arthur built. <clears throat> and he puts an elevator shaft in, and his elevator goes directly to his breakfast room, which I get to eat, the second person to eat in his breakfast room. He is telling me, about the shaft. you should see the elevator shaft. We put this in. Oh, my God, nobody has to. I got to have the breakfast. That's it. So uh, I'm like, guys, crazy. So um, he tells me, Joey, I love, what, I love your thinking. I know about you. And I just want to tell you, I'll make a promise to you right now. The stock for Home Depot, you know, we're, 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 we're 27 here. You know, this stock has not moved at all. But when I get over here, when I get here, I'm calling you. You're the first call when I get here. I said, whoa, okay. Okay, Bob, thanks so much. Um, so anyway, long story short, uh, just short of a year later, Bob is terminated. Uh, he's terminated because the stock has not moved. Uh, actually, it did move. It moved three points on the announcement of his termination. Uh, and uh, so he, he is removed. And Home Depot realizes they have forgotten. Yeah, they started this castle in the sky. Bernie and Bar Arthur were fired from a hardware store. The guys split a bottle of scotch and come up with Home Depot down in Atlanta. And, and they don't really know how to run it, but, but they, they created it. They birthed it. And, of course, they brought in uh, a Blake, Frank Blake, who was a storyteller and basically read the story built to scratch to all his 400,000 employees. Today, the company's off the charts. So uh, here's an example of a company that went from Castle in the Sky down to Fortress, over here, never made it, but went to Camelot and is now is making it. By the way, for those of you who want to know where Bob went, Bob went to Chrysler. And I endearingly, oh. called, him, I endearingly called him five years ago at a, at a speech, the anti-Chrysler. But anyway, OK, so that's enough about, uh, about Bob. Uh, so, now this is interesting. Um, I'm wrapping up here, but I, I think you'll love this. Uh, when I sold to BCG, you know, they're Boston Consulting, analytics, you know. Like, you know, I felt like when I sold to them, I was, I, I told the CEO, I said, you know, you're the Navy, and you just bought a pirate ship. And, but they've been, they were great, and they actually uh, did the analytics. These are real analytics around the, the Camelot matrix, which now they use. And I thought you'd be interested to see where, where different companies are. 
not oddly enough, even though I know the guy's a little crazy right now, but he'll make a comeback. <coughs> Tesla uh, was out there. This is now about 18 months old. But you can see companies, no, no real uh, surprise here. Uh, Comcast, actually, I, I would imagine has moved up. They've been doing a great job. But, you know, it's like I ask my students, what's your favorite brand? And they all go, Apple. Well, they're starting to change now, but it's all Apple for the last 20 years. I said, and who do you hate? Uh, Comcast. Uh, I said, so, so let me ask you a question. How many people have apples that broke? That all the hands go up? I said, do you still love Steve Jobs? I love Steve Jobs. Um, I said, so let me ask you this. When a Comcast guy comes and fixes your Comcast, and it's faster than ever, and it's unbelievable, and you can watch the game, and everything's great. Do you love them now? Nope, still hate them. So this is, that's a, that's, <clears throat> that's a problem. But these, and, and the other thing here is that, and this is what BCG found out, and this is fascinating, and this was Bob Nardelli's problem. They found out that there are boundaries in the northwest and the southeast corner. What that means is, if you want to go all the way here, you can't, you can only go to where Bob went, unless you go north. And of course, up northeast is Camelot. I just thought that was fascinating. Um, so I'll leave that up just for a second. OK, so <clears throat> in case you don't read the book, um, you know, Broad River Retail and Ashley, these are brands. But with purpose, they become stands. And I just want to make sure that you understand what's coming, because it is magnificent. These are the old words. These are the words that are anachronisms. They're punitive. They're goofy. I mean, <clears throat> uh, and, and, and this is what happens when you, you, you add purpose and you get these new words. So I just want to go through a few of them. In the old days, <coughs> a brand is what, what you were. You know? Now it's why. And it was all about a point of difference. Now it's about a point of view. And, and you can think about this. Would you rather go on a date with a point of view or a point of difference? I'd much rather have a point of view. I mean, like, have a conversation, a point of difference. <laughs> so, um, mar uh, so a brand was all market-driven. You went out, and you did quants, and you come back and go, oh, this is what the customer wants. Well, that doesn't work because the customer, especially millennials, they're built, they're born with BS meters. And they know 91% of them won't even work for a company unless it has, unless it has an articulated purpose. Um, so ethos driven, you've heard me say that word a lot, going back to the beginnings. As I have a chapter in the book, it's called The Fruits Are in the Roots. So going back to the roots so you can uh, gather the fruits. You know about, I've talked to you about distinctive versus competitive. You are all, I mean, I heard you, I was outside and you sound like missionaries. You sound like you're on fire. You're not employed, you're already missionaries. But the contracts that we have, when you have purpose, you don't have contracts, you don't have purchase orders. You've got relationships and you've got covenants. And the Charlies of the world, both Charlies of the world, they're not going to look at the next quarter even, and even, by the way, Wall Street pundits are looking at, uh, at changing the uh, reporting schedules. But great leaders look at the next quarter and the next quarter century. It's a stereoscopic view. Um, I want to talk just a little about, because I'm running out of time here, about loyalty and love. This is my favorite. This, this is amazing. So, and, and this will help you personally. Um, so, I've always had a problem in marketing with words like competitive. And, and then this word came out seven years ago. I was teaching, and they said, well, loyalty programs. We have to have a loyalty program. I said, wait a second, loyalty? Well, let me go. And I was giving a speech. There was like 2,000 people there. And I, I just had an experiment. I said, hey, how many of you guys are married out there? So, so I, I said, uh, so, uh, so how many of you got married because you wanted your spouse to be loyal to you? And nobody raised their hand. It was unbelievable. And then I realized, what, what, what are we thinking here? Like loyalty, that's like, that's like a weird, that's like a kinky, that's like 40 shades of gray kind of, like, <laughs> no, really, it's like shackle stuff. I mean, it's, like, it's loyalty. That's like, yuck. So, so I thought, well, maybe, maybe business is ready for love. And I went to uh, Yale University to a man named Robert Sternberg, head of psycho psychology department at Yale. He's written 45 books on love. This is the leading authority on love. And I said to him, I've got to write business correlates for purpose for love, so you've got to help me. So you tell me about love, and then I'll write the business correlates. He goes, OK, there are only three of them. I said, oh, great, OK. So the first one is passion. I said, passion, wow. OK, I got on a train to go to Connecticut, to uh, New Hampshire. Like I, we use that word in marketing all the time. So passion, no offense, doctor, but passion, Got it. Okay, passion. Marketing, marriage, passion. Okay, 
Some, it wanes, it goes, it wanes. Yeah, okay, fine. He said, the second is intimacy. I said, intimacy? Oh, I can't talk to boardrooms about intimacy. I can't, I, can't, I can't go to CEOs and talk about intimacy. It's just that they're going to have a problem with that. I, I got enough problems with purpose. So I said, let me ask you this. What if I exchange the word dialogue, like dialogue? He goes, hmm, okay. I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll buy that. Passion and dialogue. I said, oh, that's great. So what's number three? He goes, that's the tough one. He said, it's not going to happen. He says, it's the reason why divorce happens. Now he's really got me. Now, and it's the reason why companies, and I'm like, oh, come on, please. Passion and dialogue. I said, what's the third one? He said, constancy. I said, constancy? Wow. Is that like consistency? Well, it's sort of like consistency. It's about, it's sort of consistency plus commitment is 24-7 constancy. I said, let me get this straight. I could be passionate and I could have, be intimate. He goes, yeah, that's called the one night stand. I said, um, I, I'm, I'm starting to understand now. I, so, uh, so, yeah, so if I'm constant and I'm intimate, no, that's called friendship. And I'm, like all of a sudden it's starting to come all together. And he said, the trouble you're going to have, Joey, is you're going to have trouble getting companies to do this concurrently versus sequentially. So a lot of people, oh, we have to be passionate about the brand, and we have to communicate with our customer, and then we have to do it every day. No, it's, we have to be passionate about the customer. So it's all the time, all three are working. This constancy, and we saw it in secret. People on the, that there was a dialogue, and it was constant, it was never stopping. So there's no such thing as weekends, and there's no such thing as nighttime. It's a constant uh, love of customer. Not, you don't have to call them or go out with them or anything, you just have to, no, they have to know you're there and thinking about them. You know, it's sort of like um, uh, I was talking to somebody the other day. If you go to Facebook followers and following, you've got like 10 million people, no, 100 million people following Home Depot, and they follow 46. Well, how do you think those people feel? <laughs> I mean, this is like really simple stuff. It's something that we can all do. If, you are, if there are people following, at least like them. I mean, it's not like you're going to get, you know, accosted or... I mean, I, I think people are just scared, but this constancy that Sternberg talked about is, I, I think, critical. And that brings me to, probably towards the end here with, oh, my last story. Love this story. It's a very short story. It's the shortest story of all. Um, one of my favorite amazing international stories, and I, I talked about this at Davos when I was at the World Economic Forum this past year, was when the United States bombed Japan, and we bombed the hell out of Japan, the place was leveled. Um, there was a company, there were a lot of companies that were just starting out, and there was one company that was pretty amazing. Uh, they were a rice maker, they made rice makers. And it was run by a, their Charlie, Akio Morita. And Akio uh, was a very passionate, purposeful guy. And he had no money to pay any of these people. But everyone loved Akio because Akio, the people felt like he had a greater purpose. So they came to Akio and said, we'll work for you for free. For free. But we want to build the best company in Japan. He says, we're going to. And the company built over four or five years, six years. Six year in, they're, really, they're making money. They hire some consultants. Mistake. Um, and the consultants tell them, we can write a strategy plan for you that will make you, that will create an empire. They go, okay. A month later, they come back. It's an all-day presentation to Akio and his leadership. And the bottom line is that if they listen to the consultants, that this company, which they just named Sony, would become the number one technology company in Japan. And there was a lot of bowing. Uh, <laughs> And Akio uh, closes his eyes. He said, look, you know, I love what you've told us. And I, we will execute this. But I don't want to be the number one. I don't want to be the number one technology company in Japan. I want Japan to be the number one technology company in the world. Country, that is. And that shift, you can, you can feel that shift, that bigness and that, that benevolence and that love and that notion that he must have gone just like we, where we started, he must have gone from the brain to the heart. He must have 
done his own Ella Fitzgerald. And, and these Ellas that we, we, we're all Akios and we're all Ellas. And we're all, you know, you know when, uh, when, uh, the, when Kennedy said we're going to the moon and we were facing a Vietnam War and the economy was in the hopper and civil rights, the worst civil rights situation since the Civil War. And he, he goes to Rice University and he says, all the journalists are there and say, they say, oh, I wonder what he's going to talk about, the war, economy? Civil rights, oh, definitely civil rights. No, 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 there's a war. And he says, in 10 years, we're going to put a man on the moon. Doesn't talk about the war. Doesn't talk about economy. NASA couldn't make coffee, let alone the metal that on the, on the, on the rockets. But he knew, just like our forefathers, and this is critical, the founders of this country had this bizarre idea of going west. But it was an idea that captured the imagination of the country. I'm not sure I believe in Manifest Destiny, all that stuff. But all Kennedy did was, instead of going west, he went north. And the entire country mobilized around a purpose that was impossible. And they, it stayed for 10 years. And that's the last point I want to make. If you have a purpose, if Broad River has a purpose, it will never come and go. It will always come and stay. And this is the biggest difference between a statement of purpose, which is a timeless truth set up for a timely need, than a tagline in an advertising campaign that doesn't really add up to much of anything. So with that, I'm going to turn it back to Charlie. <laughs>